Hi, everyone. It's good to see you and thank you for attending the quantitative analysis and survey research workshop that will be conducted this afternoon by Kevin Pomelant. I'm Sue Bothman from ARL and really pleased to welcome everyone here this afternoon. It's good to see you all, especially after our summer hiatus from our workshops. Today's workshop is part of our series of training opportunities for the Research Library Impact Framework Initiative. And those of you who have attended some of our earlier sessions have heard, have heard me say this. Our overall goal for this series is to help all of us develop or improve our skills in conducting research and assessment in our libraries. We have a few remaining workshops in this series that will address reporting our research. When we share the materials from this workshop with everyone, we will include, include registration information for those workshops as well. Uh, we are recording this session and we will share the recording and slides and other documentation that Kevin has prepared with everyone. Uh, you're welcome to share this information and these materials with colleagues who could not attend today. Um, and we do have a few people on our list that we knew couldn't attend but wanted the materials. Um, so Kevin, welcome. Thank you again. And let me turn the podium over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Sue, for the introduction. Um, and today's session, today's workshop is about quantitative analysis and survey research. Um, but before I get started, I did want to ask um, that if anyone has any questions to feel free to break in verbally, I will be monitoring the chat, but it's a bit easier um, if you if you just go ahead and interrupt me and I'll answer them uh, as they come. And so just to get orient you where we are, where we are in the process of survey development. Uh, we've had earlier workshops on designing a survey um, and then also doing visualization and tableau after the data collection period. So now we're into the preliminary quantitative analysis part of our survey research, which includes exploratory data analysis and hypothesis testing. Um, and so survey research is a little bit different from some other methodologies that I've worked with in that your hypotheses actually change and, and probably should change after you finished your data collection and you've done your visualizations and you see some initial patterns in the data. So of course, when you're doing your survey design, you're thinking about um, you know, what questions you want to answer, what themes you're interested in learning about from your respondents and their opinions about those themes. Um, and you design the questions to get at those themes. But then you get your, your results and you may find out that your respondents actually think about those themes in different ways than you anticipated. And it's totally okay and encouraged to adjust your data analysis methods in response to that information um, and to include that in your, your statistical your statistical work. So in survey research, we're not only um, not only testing respondents' answers, but we're also testing respondents' interpretations of our survey itself and using that information um, to redesign and reevaluate our hypotheses after data collection has ended. And so I'll take you through the process that I go through um, after data collection, uh, which I think is one of the most important parts of survey research since that's really the the guide um, that sets up the statistical analyses that you will do um, at the end of your research. So it's kind of the neck that turns the head um, of your research project. And so um, today I'll take you through several aspects of quantitative analysis. Um, the first most important part is data cleaning. And data cleaning is essential because it helps preserve the reliability and the validity of the survey research project that you've just completed, the data collection that you just completed. Um, so you need to be eliminating responses that are uh, extraneous and that are actually detrimental to learning uh, about your respondents' opinions on your, on your work. There's several methods that I'll go into with, with that part of quantitative analysis. Um, and then a more flexible, um, so we go through pretty strict methods for data cleaning, and then we move into more flexible methods in exploratory data analysis that help you revisit initial questions and assumptions um, by looking at response rates, actual answers to your questions, and to cross tabs, which I think are actually a, um, an undervalued part of survey research. And I'll, tell, I'll explain to you what a cross tab is and give you a visual just to see what it looks like. Um, 
although you may have seen it if you ever looked at a, a polling memo around the election, they tend to publish those. Um, I'll go into item analysis as a part of composite creation. Some people pronounce it com composite, um, depending on which person you're listening to. Um, and so in item analysis, what you're really um, doing is figuring out which items are most important and which items fit into which themes. And it's those themes that are we use to um, create a composite. Scoring methods, which are just quantitative methods to calculate um, what your respondents uh, scores are, um, how they're responding to your questions. And you know, if you just approach it simply, it might just be a mean score, but there are actually several different methods to um, calculate end scores depending on what you are emphasizing over other over other methods. And they'll take you and do some statistics work um, and hypothesis testing comparisons of means and then um, Pearson correlations, which I think are a key statistical test to use both um, to evaluate your results on your own, but also as a way to share with stakeholders who might be interested in your work. Um, it's a particularly intuitive statistic that I find helps um, not only to just report results, but to drive change um, in whatever program it is that you're asking about in your survey, whatever project that you want to evaluate um, to actually implement for the next year changes in whatever organizational structure or to any other different um, methods that you want to use to, to use the survey results that you get from your project. And some conclusions um, about best practices in quantitative analysis. So data cleaning is the first stop on our, our tour through quantitative analysis. So data cleaning, I don't actually have this on here, but um, it does come up sometimes depending on what sort of web design you're, do, you're, you're using. So if you're using um, a web survey, maybe it's not so likely that you actually get someone from outside your population responding to the survey. It's common for people to email their surveys to specific email addresses. So you have a pretty good idea that those are the only people who are responding to your survey. At the same time, it's possible that someone else could get access to the survey and answer it, even though they're outside of the population of your survey. So say you have a, um, a survey that goes out on a listserv and you really just want people who are on that listserv to answer that survey. Um, but you find that when you get your survey results back that you that some of the email addresses that are listed um, in the respondents um, answers are actually aren't on that listserv. So it could be your decision that because they're not part, a part of your population um, that you want to study to remove those responses. Um, at the same time, this sort of removal does require typically for you to um, collect some sort of identifiable information about the respondent in order to eliminate them. Um, so that is something that I do when, um, when I'm doing survey work for clients, I actually use, um, I use email address to confirm that that's the, the respondent that we think it is. Um, or other information linking them, including birth year. But for, for, your, for your work, um, you might have a more expansive definition of, of your population that you wanna work with. So it's up to you whether you wanna be strict about, um, about excluding people who weren't necessarily in the population that you want to research. But one thing I definitely recommend for, for any survey research project is a deduplication de of responses. Um, this can be a problem with paper surveys or with, um, with web surveys as well, in that uh, a respondent may respond twice. Um, they may, oh, looks like I may have a question, so let me just pause there. Got a question, in your analysis, do you include partially uh, completed surveys? So that's a, that's a good question. And part of, you know, part of what I'll go into is what, uh, in a few slides, is, is what constitutes a completed survey. In some cases I have, created, um, I have declared that a partial survey is a complete survey, but a lot of it depends on what you value. So in some survey research projects, I've set a minimum number of questions um, that make a respondent qualify um, as, a, as a complete survey. In other, in, other, um, in other surveys, it's the number of gate questions. And so as a reminder, a gate question is, a, is typically a yes or no question that asks if a respondent has experienced a service, if they've gone to the help desk, if they visited the library. 
Um, and if they answer, say, I've had one survey project where if they answer a majority of those questions, just the gate questions, then they qualify as a complete survey. So the point is to um, understand what it is that you want out of your survey. So if you need people to um, experience a, a certain number of services that you offer, um, and you're evaluating that through these gate questions where you get a yes or no answer, and a respondent only answers yes to one of them, you may want to eliminate that respondent uh, and any respondent who answers too few of those um, to, to reject that as, a, uh, as an incomplete survey. Or you could use um, a mean number of questions. Um, so, so if there are 40 questions, you might want 20 questions to be answered before including that as a complete survey. Um, so yeah, um, just make sure that you're setting the standard, the same standard for the entire uh, number of respondents to your survey. There are some other uh, methods beyond just deduplication for data cleaning. Um, there's also disqualification, which um, not all surveys use. Some of sometimes. Uh, when I'm working with a client, I'm required to include all survey responses, no matter um, the responses that are given, um, since they're for regulatory purposes. And other ones, I have more, I have more leeway, <clears throat> excuse me, to eliminate surveys that I believe have been answered inconsistently or um, just with a lack of attention. So dealing with any population, some respondents will answer questions randomly. Um, you can tell this because they will answer. Um, so the example I have here on, on, the side, on the slide is that uh, two questions are really ask about the same topic. If they had a positive experience about this library, the Petit Library at Penn State, and then sort of the repeated questions to ask in a different way um, if they've ever had a negative experience at the Petit Library. And so if they answer um, in contradiction in both of those questions, um, you might feel that you should eliminate just those questions for that respondent, or you can also eliminate the entire survey. Um, I recommend using it as a last resort. I'm more concerned about um, beyond just inconsistent responses is when respondents will answer the same answer choice to every question, or it's clear that they're just picking um, a certain letter pattern like A, B, C, D over and over again. Those are the things you want to be looking at when you're doing your data cleaning to eliminate those responses. So the, the next step in data cleaning is actually skip logic enforcement. Um, so if you remember from our, our earlier workshops, skip logic um, is the structure that's designed in your survey to take respondents from one question to another question. So this is typically uh, involves a gate question. So if they have uh, a yes or a no to a question about a service, if they've gone to help the help desk and they say yes, then they can go on to the next series of questions um, that are about help desk service. Or if they answer no, then the point would be to have them skip that series of questions because they wouldn't have a relevant answer to any of those questions. Um, and you want to eliminate those extraneous um, remarks. Now, 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 typically in a web survey, you can enforce skip logic so that the person who answers no to that gate question never sees those questions. But you know things can go wrong. Um, sometimes, uh, even in, in web surveys, I've seen people somehow answering those questions. Sometimes it has to do with them um, leaving the web page and coming back, and then the, the web survey programming forgets their, their response, and they're somehow allowed to answer those questions. So it's good to check this um, at the end uh, of your data collection to go into data cleaning. And the easy way to do that is to actually look at frequencies. And so I have a frequency example here. Uh, questions one through three of the survey are represented. Um, so you can see that there are 160 respondents to question one and say there's no skip logic. Everyone who answers question one goes to question two. So you would, you would expect um, 160 responses for question two, which there are. But say I put a skip logic restriction that only people who answer question two with answer choice A would be allowed to answer question three. So that would mean that there could only be a maximum of 80 responses in question three. Um, but I can see from my frequencies that there's many more than 80, uh, 80 responses. So I know that something has gone wrong with my skip logic. 
So the first thing in data cleaning that you can do is to look at these frequencies um, and then check them against your skip logic to see if anything has gone wrong. Um, and then once you've, you're satisfied that the frequencies make sense, that it's mathematically impossible for the skip logic to um, have not been enforced by your frequencies, then you can, you can move on. Um, for, for finalization, um, we're moving the extraneous responses to so those responses that the skip logic doesn't allow. We're checking for completeness of administrative data. You may, um, this is something I didn't answer before. So if you may require the respondent to um, at least um, provide some identifying information, whether it's their name or maybe just um, a pin code that you sent them if you want, if you're anonymizing your survey and that way you know that this is a person you wanted to answer the survey. Um, you have only one survey complete from each respondent. And then finally, we're using some metrics to determine what is a complete survey. So I have a few slides about that. So what, what is considered a complete survey? Um, another example um, is that you know maybe a respondent um, hasn't answered a lot of your questions, but if you want them to at least have seen all of your questions, you can require them to have at least progressed to the final question, even if they've skipped them. Um, you can require that all answer questions have been answered. It's a bit dangerous since um, most, most people will skip some questions. Um, or you can set a certain threshold of questions that have been answered. Or you can even calculate a score based on um, weighted importance of questions. I think that's a little bit beyond what a lot of us needs to what a lot of us need to do, but it can be done. Um, or set um, set a few questions that you think are important um, as the bare minimum for survey completes. And so the so I plot the number of questions um, answered by the by the number of respondents so that I have, have an understanding of how many people are getting to all of the questions. Of course, I want them to answer as many questions as possible. And just to, to point out um, uh, in this chart, a question is considered answered if they if they were forced by the skip logic to skip it. So I'm not penalizing them if they have um, been forced by the skip logic to skip it. It's only those questions they have skipped on their own. They've omitted for reasons that aren't clear. They just were busy or didn't, didn't choose to answer that question. Um, so in this survey, um, there's actually quite a high number that didn't answer that many questions. And so um, I don't want to probably put the barrier too, too strict on this because I'll lose an enormous amount of information. So for this, I would probably put, um, I would probably actually favor a gate question method just to make sure that they're answering yes or no to a service and be pretty lenient about um, uh, the number of responses that they're giving to the, the other questions. And so um, I do the same thing for, for the gate questions to map it out, same survey. Um, and I'm finding that, you know, a pretty big majority of, of respondents are answering at least two gate questions. So um, if I have seven services and I want to, I want to have people who are at least able to answer about some of the services in, in the library, then I would probably set the limit at um, at least at two gate questions answered to be considered a complete survey so that all of the respondents who have only answered zero to one gate questions would be eliminated from the survey and it would not be considered a complete survey. Does that answer the, the question about um, the complete surveys or any other questions that may have come up? A lot of times in survey research, there's um, the rules are, are flexible depending on what your what your intentions are. So if you really want to encourage opinions from people who who haven't had a lot of um, interaction with your services, but you are interested in their opinions on that specific service that they've encountered, then you can set pretty loose um, restrictions on the survey complete. Whereas if you really only want your um, responses from people who have visited every single one of your services or um, you know are committed to, to your library or spend a lot of time there, then you can set, uh, you can set um, you know, more strict regulations on what is considered a survey complete. And so to continue into exploratory data analysis, um, 
you know, we're approaching getting, uh, getting a final data set. We've established our survey completes. We know how many people have answered our survey. We've done, uh, we've calculated, um, you know, how many questions each respondent has answered. So now we're thinking about actual themes in the questions and what trends we should investigate. So we, were, we may look at scores immediately. We're going to, um, we're going to look at the themes of the, the questions and how they fit together, and then some uh, initial statistical analyses to determine you know, what sorts of differences we have uh, amongst the respondents that have answered our survey. So it's really at this point that we revisit our initial research questions. So if it's something that we, pri we prioritize, I would plot um, answers to the different questions based on the, the demographic uh, of identification um, of each survey respondent. So you may be interested in different, in different answer patterns amongst genders, uh, amongst races or ethnicities. And this is really an opportunity to start to do that before you go into statistical analyses. Um, even, even more, uh, just as important, I think, is that we're, we're looking at um, you know, the, ex the experiences that you're, you're evaluating. And when you put your survey design together, you probably had in mind the certain surveys, uh, the certain services that you offer and what you want to learn about them. Um, and it actually may be the case that um, the, your, your respondents think about those services in a different way and that you need to reformulate your hypothesis about um, how, about how your, um, how your respondents are interacting with your services. And I'm thinking of a time when I actually had to do this, I had to reformulate a hypothesis um, from a, a client, a, a health insurer who, um, who came to us with some, some, some data from a different survey and asked us to, to run um, a new survey in the, in the following year. And they really were focused on customer service and uh, overall satisfaction. So um, I'm sure we've all had an experience of talking to a health plan over the telephone um, so that they were very focused on, on the, um, the telephone uh, service operators, so the, the customer service assistants on the phone who answer questions about the health plan um, and how that affected overall satisfaction. And so, you know, we ran our initial analysis, the initial mean scores, and then we started to group the questions together into composites, which I'll, I'll describe more later. Um, and this is when we can start inferring things about what's happening in the data. So we noticed that a lot of the, the customer service questions were heavily correlated with the questions about claims processing. So um, people were answering in the same way to questions about the people who pick up the telephone answer questions about the health plan um, and the same uh, as, as the same as um, the questions that we're asking about how their claims were processed in a timely manner. And so for the health plan, those are two separate services, um, sort of the administrative and, and policy of, of responding to those, those claims and then the customer service, which is really the communication um, about those services. Um, and so what we were telling the health plan is that the, the way that the survey was designed is that um, the opinions about the claims processing session, uh, the claims processing services um, was bleeding over into um, the customer service question. So um, people's opinions was, co was colored much more by the claims processing than by the, um, the customer service interaction over the telephone. And so we, encouraged, um, we worked with um, the health plan to actually redesign questions so that um, we're asking more specifically about customer service on the phone and separated them um, structurally from questions in the survey about um, claims processing so that we could actually tease out the differences in those services. And although that's a, um, you know, it's a, an example from a health plan, this can happen in a lot of uh, of, diff of different venues. Um, sometimes 
or one service offered is much, much more important or just more in the forefront of the minds of your respondents. And you may see at the end of, of your research project that a lot of those answers are correlated all together. Um, and that's likely because one experience is coloring everything else, not necessarily that they're all thematically and organically related. And so that could prompt you to redesign your survey to try and reword it and really get the respondent to think about the specific mechanics of the service provided, um, whether it's the actual interaction um, at the help desk or whether it's the software they use in the in the library. So I just I use that as an example um, because this is really the time when you're able to start to see those patterns and you can think about um, the ideas will start to pop up about you know redesign redesigning the survey for next year or just um, not over interpreting your results. So if you get similar answers across questions, um, you don't want to, you want to get in the mind of the respondent and, and think about what is their most important, um, what is the most important um, priority for them? And I'll get in some, into some statistics that actually help you identify that. So for, you know, for subgroup analysis, um, You know, I like to actually try. I like to um, track by by age group and do and do response rates. So it's pretty common for um, younger respondents to be less responsive to a survey. You'll just get fewer responses. So it's a good idea to to plot that to see um, if you're looking at your overall results in the survey. If a large number of your respondents are are, are older, it may not be as representative. Um, of younger opinions than you would have thought. And so that's something to keep in mind when you're reporting your results. Um, and I will get into a discussion about, about weighting results um, as a method to um, as a method as a method to deal with that, although there are some concerns about using that method as well. So another thing that comes up during exploratory data analysis is time sensitive evaluation. A lot of survey projects are run to um, evaluate a program that has happened over the last year. Um, and so when you're looking at your data, you can focus in on those time specific questions. If there has been a change, a new initiative that you're measuring, um, you can see if your respondents are answering different to those questions. Maybe they're more positive about the new initiative or there's just more responses to that question. So you know that there's interest in it. So yeah, just to sum up, we were, when we we're revisiting our initial research questions, we're thinking about which components of our services are most important. Um, what information can we gain from the survey that is actionable? And this is important um, for working with stakeholders. I find that when I report you know, cross tabs by themselves or just mean scores to a bunch of questions, um, it, surveys can, tend to, ten, can be pretty long. Um, they're getting longer. So it's hard for people to orient to 30 questions on a survey. Um, and so if you just, if I just report the mean scores, um, it's going to be hard for my stakeholder, for my client to know what to do with that information. Um, and so the statistical analysis that we do will help you present that information. Um, and how do we gain information from our survey to cre create or modify a new program? If there's the time sensitive project, um, we can use information uh, from those questions that touch on that project to redesign the survey or to um, you know, reorganize our initiative for, for the next year and test the change um, in that initiative and how it was implemented and the respondents reaction to it, which is something that I think has come up in a lot of your surveys with respect to the pandemic and how your services have ch has changed. So um, when there's a big event like that or an initiative, um, survey research can really illuminate um, your respondents um, reaction to that and how and how they perceive the implementation, um, particularly when there's a fast change. Um, you may not have had a lot of interaction with your population. So particularly when people aren't seeing each other, survey research can be even more important to gain information about um, events like that. So I won't, I did touch yeah, on this. Yes, please. Yes. Um, I think you mentioned once or twice um about revising the survey um is there a caveat i guess percentage of revision 
that would impact your longitudinal exploratory analysis? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yes, it is true that when you're when you're re redesigning your survey for the next year, you're changing your wording. Um, it always comes with the caveat that you may not be able to make a direct comparison between um, those individual questions. However, um, and I'll get into this a bit later, when we talk about composites, um, I'm putting together questions that are related to a specific theme. Um, so if you're reporting just composite scores according to a set, according to one theme, say customer service, and the individual questions change within that composite, you can still report the customer service metric um, composite score. Um, and that can be a thematic comparison between your change survey from one year um, to the previous year. But it may, yes, it may have an effect on, and it, it will have an effect on the individual questions, which is sort of why um, I push back against reporting individual questions, um, results, and relying on them, since you may find out that um, you don't, you, you get rid of that question the next year. But if you create a composite, you're really killing two birds with one stone, you're making it more interpretable, and you're also making your survey more reliable and stable over, over time. Um, so it's really, uh, it, if you're testing the same things you, themes year over year, I don't think there's a big question um, about the fairness of doing a longitudinal comparison, but whenever I'm doing a survey report and this and the question the question wording has changed, I do make a note of it um, to alert stakeholders that part of the reason that the the um, respondent's opinion has changed may be because of the wording. Let's see, just want to make sure I'm good on timing, but. Um, yeah, these questions are great, so feel free to, to break in. Um, for survey response rates, yeah, I don't want to spend too, too much time on this. Um, it does have to do with weighting, which I'll get into in a minute, but Kevin? I do, yes, yes, please. Oh, um, I just had a question around just sort of a follow up to that. Um, when it's apparent in the responses, that the interpretation of the question was obviously, um, there was a high degree of variation, right? Um, mm -hmm. And um, so you see, and you're planning to do a follow-up survey uh, along the sort of longitudinal lines to sort of track a trend, let's say like um, asking a question around, um, um, you know, has your, has your library, uh, hired, uh, within a particular, um, area, um, and you, you try not to provide an example, so not to be leading, but then obviously the interpretation, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, around research data management, there's many different types of ways that, and job types, and so, uh, the obviously the respondents respond in a certain way, others respond in another way. You see that that's a potentially fruitful area. And yet, uh, you know, where would you go with that in terms of, you know, comparison, um, you know, adjusting for say the, the next survey? Yeah, that's a good question. So if you've already conducted the survey, um, you know, I would I would follow up with um, a few of the respondents if you're able to if it's not anonymous from um, sort of the two different interpretations or maybe uh, the different interpretation they have of research meant to see what they are actually thinking. Um, if you have if you see this problem coming, um, the other the other thing you can do is to allow them to write in a response that explains um, in more detail what they're thinking about that topic, so that when you redesign your survey. Um, you sort of know the the points of differentiation in their opinions. Um, but yeah, I think yeah when there's um, when there's confusion about the question itself um, and the survey has already been completed, the best thing to do is to follow up and do some interviewing to understand how the respondents are have respond have interacted with your question. Is that something that that's possible in your case? Um, 
our the particular survey I'm thinking about was actually a, a national survey, and we asked uh, like so the the responses were um, collated around uh, by institution, and um, and then for anonymization at the institutional level. So. Um, we did have a, a textual answer, um, but as you can probably imagine, even within the textual answer, um, I mean, people are reporting, you know, fairly broad job titles. Job titles are not necessarily descriptive, uh, depending on what you're trying to answer. So, um, I mean, we definitely saw it as a place to explore. Um, you know, uh, for the next go round and sort of getting uh, maybe a gate question with like uh, logic based on that. But um, uh, yeah, as a comparison, we, we struggled with that as a group. And so I was just kind of interested to hear. Yeah, I mean, that can be a challenge. Um, it is, it can be, it can be difficult to write a question that you don't want to lead them into giving you specific responses, but then you get responses that are too disparate to really work with. Um, so you can use, you know, typically, and since our, our language is pretty regulated, this is something we, we deal with quite a lot, is to have a, a specific definition um, that, that tries not to be leading. So we'll have some expository text. Um, so we might describe what research management is without mentioning any titles, um, and, then, and then guide them into um, answering questions about that field. But I think at the same time, um, you have to, uh, there's the element where you have to take the responses um, at, at their word. So if um, if there's sort of a differ differential interpretation of what research management is, um, then that's actually sort of a, an answer that that's, I think is actionable, that um, the problem isn't so much, the problem may not be the responses to research management is that, that some institutions may not have a concept of, of what that is um, for, for them necessarily. And so you can create a follow-up survey to um, go into more detail if you have that ability. Let's see. Okay, yes, yeah, so survey re uh, response rates um, have a breakdown here by race. Um, since I want to see the difference between the response rate um, by by uh, racial subgroup, so I know the um, the natural makeup of the population itself by by race, and so in this survey that I did for a for a client, um, African American respondents were underrepresented relative to the population, and Asian respondents were overrepresented, um, while white respondents. Or about, um, or about respond, were responding at about the same rate as you would expect from their number in the population, um, and so this is useful information to know that when you're reporting your results, um, that there is a slight difference in the demographic makeup of your respondents compared to the population itself. Now, what to what to do about that is something that's very tricky in in survey research, um, and that can involve waiting. Um, Let's see where I, yeah, I think, uh, so for, for waiting, and I, I do want to talk a little bit about waiting because it, it, it comes up um, as a, because I know that people get frustrated when they don't have an exact, um, uh, when their sample isn't the same the, as the population by demographic makeup, which is pretty typical since it's very difficult to, to get that to match perfectly. It's, it's common, and some groups just have different response rates than others. Um, one of the challenges with waiting um, is that, so for, for, for with waiting, what you're doing is you're um, taking the responses from that, that population. So for the African-American group, for example, in this, uh, in this survey project, and then you're re-weighting them as a percentage of the entire population. So you're taking the responses from that small, that, that group, and then expanding them as more important um, than the number of respondents, but as important as their um, demographic makeup um, in the population itself. So you're using that smaller than expected response group um, and expanding it um, to its proportion, the population itself. 
Um, so this is controversial, controversial because what you're what you end up doing is you're sort of doing a mini survey within a survey. Um, and the fact that you've gotten smaller responses and then you're extrapol extrapolating means that you're you're taking a smaller subgroup with um, a higher error and um, you're actually expanding that error by um, increasing that weight within the, the population itself. And so that can have um, real life consequences and we've actually had a good example in the 2020 election. So in the 2016 election, um, a lot of pollsters made a correction when they after finding out that their results were, were erroneous, um, that, um, call, um, that um, voters without a college education were less likely to respond to surveys, but nonetheless go to the polls. And so their answer um, was to actually weight um, those voters more heavily. So in the 2020 election, um, when they got the same response pattern, those, those same voters weren't responding to their surveys um, and then inflating that population to its um, projected proportion of the voting population itself. The problem was is that there, the people who didn't respond to surveys were characteristically different from college uh, to voters without a college education. Um, and that actually made the problem worse in a lot of states. So um, you're actually taking that error from the the uh, the characteristically different people who didn't respond to the survey and expand and expanding it because you're just taking the people who did want to respond to the survey, um, which has ended up being the cause of the error in the 2020 election. So it's one of the the challenges when dealing with weighting um, is that if you think that there is a characteristic difference about uh, uh, of the group that's not responding to the survey, then weighting it waiting um, without their responses may actually make the problem worse. And it's better just to go with the um, demographic makeup that you've received. Um, however, if you think that there, there is no characteristic difference between the people who have responded to the survey and who haven't within that group, then it is safer to do a waiting protocol. But, um, you know, there's, there's a, it's a pretty big controversy in, in survey research. So there's no easy answer to this. So I encourage you, I encourage um, people who are running survey research projects to be open about the different demographic makeup of their survey respondents compared to the population um, as a part of your discussion, and then to wait um, carefully. Now, for a lot of you, this may not actually come into play since you're just getting responses from everyone um, and you're doing the best you can. There's not a whole lot of things that you could do, whereas pollsters have millions of people that they can they can uh, reach out to in addition. So the better solution in a lot of ways is to oversample, um, to talk to more people so that you can actually get more respondents from that specific subgroup, whereas that may not be an option to you since you're already surveying the entire population. So answer choice counts. Um, it's a simple way to look over your, your responses um, to the, the individual questions of your survey research project and get a sense of, of your respondent preferences as you're going through your exploratory data analysis, which I'm sure many of you have done just naturally. Um, but then cross tabs, which I mentioned before, I think are an underutilized um, uh, tactic in looking at survey results and exploratory data analysis, uh, which I'll describe here. And so what a crosstab is, is um, you're looking at how one group who has responded to a question in one way, how they have responded uh, also to a different question. So for example, you can look at the people who responded yes to question one and see how they answered question eight. So if they um, answered um, positively to a question about customer service, how are they also thinking about um, software, for example, software in your library? Um, so that can reveal hidden subgroups and preferences within your data. So you might find that um, a cross tab with younger respondents, they're really interested. Um, they have um, positive opinions about the software or is more maybe your, your older respondents don't. Um, we can also find that um, you know, people who respond positively to customer service are just responding positively to everything. They're just uh, a positive group. Um, so you you basically just put the you pit the two questions against each other and look for trends for when you're doing your exploratory analysis before you go into a statistical analysis. Um, 
So one of the things that I am looking for when I'm doing cross tabs analysis, you know, I'm looking for errors in survey design because it can help you look at the counts and, and you get one more chance to fix skip logic. Um, if the frequencies are um, not matching up with what they should, they should be based on the skip logic. Um, and then something that I, I like to look at is sort of confounds and demographic variables. So um, maybe you're interested in ethnic subgroups. So I work with um, uh, a lot with, with survey uh, with clients who are interested in, in um, opinions from Latino respondents. And so one of the issues that I always have to deal with is that Latino respondents tend to be younger than other demographics. And so it's not always clear. Um, and I can see this in the in the data, whether I think whether um, the statistical analysis will determine that the effect is due to the um, the youth of the respondent or because of the ethnicity. And so it's good to know those confounds in advance before you go into um, a regression analysis, which will actually be in the next, the next um, workshop that we have or before we even do some correlation work. Let me show you what just a visually, visually what a, what a cross tab is. Um, really just a matrix. And so um, for here, you can, you might want to zero in on the answers to, to question one. So the most frequent users of your library and to see how satisfied they are with your library services. Um, so from these cross tabs, I can already tell that um, those who have visited the least, who have visited the library the least um, are the least satisfied, whereas those who have visited a lot are most satisfied. So you might actually think that that is a good thing, that the more that they come to your library, um, the more satisfied they are because you those are your uh, you know, those are, that's your key audience, the people you want to, um, whose attention is most important to you. And then um, also effect, effect of age um, can be important to you. Whereas in this question, I'm seeing that um, there's an effect of age, whereas older respondents are less satisfied with library services. And from this, I might, you know, I can reevaluate my hypothesis, hypotheses. Um, when I do my correlation work, I can try to see what it is that um, older respondents think is important compared to younger respondents. Um, maybe older respondents are more interested in opening hours or younger respondents are more interested in, in software. Um, so you can, do, so it's really when you're doing your cross tabs work that you're, you're thinking of questions that you can test um, with your correlation work. And item analysis. So item, an item is just a, a survey question. Um, we're going in and identifying survey questions and putting them putting them together um, into composites that are that have a, a specific theme. So this was a little bit um, covered in earlier workshops. I just want to go over it again: survey validity and reliability, um, the two keys to to a successful research project. Validity being um, a, a survey that intends that uh, measures what we intend for it to measure. So um, we're, at the, at, we're looking at um, wording questions in the way that we'll get at the concepts that we're interested in and not something unrelated to what uh, the concept we're interested in is. Um, reliability, uh, which is the ability to get the same result from the same survey if it's given a second time. Um, and then the right reliability in the sense will each respondent understand the question in the same way. And so one reliability statistic that's become very common in survey research is, is known as um, Cronbox Alpha. Um, it's not typically used for survey overall su survey re reliability, but it is used for composite development. And the history of this is that um, surveys used to be shorter. So they used to cover just one concept. Um, so the alpha statistic was used to determine the reliability for that entire survey measure. Whereas now surveys are longer so that we're looking at multiple themes within a survey itself. Um, and so uh, the alpha is actually used to put together a series of questions to develop composites. Um, so I already covered this a bit, but um, so composites are there to for, for a number of reasons. It improves interpretability. Um, instead of reporting single questions, you can report um, themes that people can latch, in, latch, latch on to, um, customer service, opening hours, software, and other things I mentioned already. I'm sure you can come up with more. Um, it's easier to track changes over time, since if you substitute one question for another, if you change the wording, and your Cronbach's alpha um, still establishes, the, the statistic establishes that um, 
it should be a part of that of that same composite like you wanted it to, then you can safely report the, the composite results without having to um, you know, talk about individual question wordings as much since you've already established that there, this composite is testing the theme that you want it to test. Um, so, which is really an improvement in, in construct validity. Um, the key thing is, I wanna point this out, um, you have an idea of what you want your composite to be when you're doing your survey design, but these composites are generated after um, data collection. So when I put together a survey, you know, I might have four questions that I think are customer service um, questions. And then I find out that maybe only two or three of the four here um, are related to each other or thematically really related uh, to each other um, using the alpha statistic. And those three, two or three questions will get reported um, together as a customer service score. And so the, the alpha statistic itself, um, it's, it's not a statistical test. So it's, you're, not, you're not doing a test for significance. You're looking at the variance um, among the questions that you, um, that you think are in, in a composite. So you might put together 10 questions you think are in a customer service composite. And um, the alpha statistics, what, statistic, which I've calculated in SPSS, um, in the next slide, um, will give you a statistic that tells you the degree of variance um, uh, amongst those questions, so the similarity and variance. And it's really a, a heuristic to select questions um, for a thematic composite. So you'll um, typically a statistical program will give you a, uh, a uh, an overall alpha score for the the questions that you've identified are. Um, what you think are in that composite so as if it's a mini survey itself and then it will give you a um a list of the alpha scores if you eliminate a question um and so on the, the example here that i have provided um you know it's a i thought that six six questions would be in the composite but it turns out if i eliminate question four um, the alpha st statistic increases um, to a pretty high number, um, to almost 0.9. So I'm willing to drop that question from the composite since it's not as related um, to the other questions. And so I would probably have a, a pretty solid five question composite here. And so the heuristic that, I'm, that I, the statisticians usually go with is anything over 0.7 is good, but if there's a major drop in your alpha um, that, um, that um, uh, sort of that interferes with your your alpha statistic then you can drop that from the question and so the alpha is really looking at um so yeah the the correlation between the, the the questions but it's a function of both the number of questions and the composite itself and their inter item uh their inter item um correlation so um the larger number of questions you have um the more the more leeway you have um but if there's only a few questions in the composite you know there'll be a large change in the alpha if you drop one compared to if you have 10 and you only drop one. So what's what's important for me, um, I like to do Pearson correlations in my, my survey research project is to differentiate these these two um, these two topics, these two concepts. So Cronbach's alpha is a measure of reliability. It's not really, it's not used for hypothesis testing. You can't run a significance test on it. And it's used for making um, a comparison amongst multiple questions. Um, you'll get a single metric for a series of questions. Whereas the Pearson correlation is I'm trying to determine the covariance amongst um, two questions. Uh, it is used in hypothesis testing. So you can figure out if two questions are significantly correlated with each other. Um, and it's key that it's only two questions. So this is important for my work um, because I want to figure out typically how um, different concepts in the survey are related to overall satisfaction, which uh, aspects of the services that the, my client is offering are most important to driving overall satisfaction since that's what they want to pay attention to the most. Um, and something that's important to stakeholders is to find out, okay, we have these resources um, what, and we have this amount of time, what can we focus on to improve our scores? What can we do to improve our respondents' opinion to make them more satisfied with what we're, we're offering them? So 
So I'm running a little bit out of time. So I may, I may come back to the scoring methods. I think you're familiar with the the t-test, but I do want to show Pearson the Pearson coefficient. Um, it's mentioned, yeah, it's useful in hypothesis testing, but I want to show you the what it, what it looks like. Um, when I'm running my correlations. Um, so each question I've given a name that's related to the concept that it's, it's getting at. Um, and in this case, it's, it's um, these are individual questions. I've just given a different name, all you, although you can do um, a Pearson correlation for the composite scores as well. Um, and so if I'm interested, and this is typical, what is the driver over, of overall satisfaction? I want to see which question um, has the highest Pearson co uh, coefficient. And so in that case, that'll be customer service is the strongest driver over, of overall satisfaction uh, with opening hours being farther behind and software availability being among the least important. But you can also see um, other correlations between the questions. So the answers to visit frequency are are similar to the, the answers on opening hours and uh, also for study rooms and opening hours. Uh, okay. So I'll touch on some scoring methods since we have a little bit of time, but I do want to leave some, some time open for questions. Um, So, so there actually are different ways to approach scoring answers from from your from your respondents. Um, probably the most intuitive way is to do proportional scoring. So that's de uh, and this scoring is dependent on the number of answer choices to your question. So in this case um, that I'm showing you, there's um, it's a never, sometimes, usually, always question. So there's four answers, and so you just divide them into uh, into the the zero to one scale zero for never and always for one. And so this is to translate the, uh, the words into a numeric valence. Um, so that's a pretty intuitive way of doing it. However, um, and this is also pretty common and it's called top box scoring. Um, and this is when you're prioritizing, um, uh, when you're sort of, you're dichotomizing your responses. Say at the end of your survey, you realize that um, a lot of people are answering very satisfied, satisfied, and neither dissatisfied nor satisfied, and you're not getting a lot of other responses. You may want to separate those two, and you're kind of, um, you've looked at your responses and you realize there just isn't enough variance in those answers. So instead, you're doing top box scoring so you can tease out the difference between um, a satisfied respondent and a not very satisfied respondent. In this way, you can just assign a one to the two top scores as if that's a perfect score for you, whereas everything else is a zero, which is the, the lowest score possible. And that way um, you're, you're teasing out minor differences um, and sort of making up for um, an imperfect uh, question design um, because you didn't anticipate in advance and it's not always possible to that um, your answers would be skewed from your respondents in a certain way towards being very, satis very satisfied and satisfied compared to not satisfied. And so top box scoring is a, is a way to um, separate those respondents. So composite scoring. Um, so the most intuitive way to do composite scoring is simply to um, Take the proportional score for each question. Um, so, for the the example here, you can see at the top at the top right, there's the the answer and the numeric equivalent, and then you're just taking an average based on the number of questions in the in that in that composite. Um, problem is that you know some respondents will skip a question, and so you have to figure out what to do with that skipped question, whether it's to um, simply remove that question from the average itself and then just put um, the, uh, the total um, over, over three um, because, that of, because of that one question. The problem is, is that when you do that, what you're doing effectively is imputing um, the answers 
to those, those three questions to the fourth question so that when you're reporting the composite score, um, you're effectively reporting that um, all the questions, when you're, when you're doing an interpretation and, and someone's reading your report, it's gonna look like all four questions were, were answered for everyone and that each question had an equal contribution. Um, so that might be okay if um, the respondents are all answering the questions in similar fashion. But if there's one question that's getting um, skipped a lot, you might wanna try a, uh, a different method. Um, so what you can do is actually just, um, you can weight the questions in a different fashion. Um, so if one answer, uh, so you can actually weight the, um, the question that hasn't been answered as much um, more so that to compensate for the fact that it has been omitted so many times. Um, so that's one of the, the corrections that you can do. Or you can actually um, do some imputation methods, which I will actually get to in the next, um, our next workshop to um, assign a, um, to assign a response um, that's been omitted based on their responses to other questions in the composite to the survey itself, which is something you can do if you're allowed to, um, um, you know, if you if you um, if you want to learn more about your respondents, but um, are also allowed to impute responses. Sometimes, for compliance reasons, it's not possible to to do that. Okay. Okay, so we just have a few minutes left. Um, so I've taken you through um, you know, quantitative analysis, which is the, the approaches you use when you have your, you complete your, your, um, your survey data collection. You've, estab you've established what is a complete survey. You've done your deduplication. You've done your exploratory data analysis to, to find um, trends and to reformulate your hypotheses. Um, you form a composite to, um, improve your, your survey reliability and your validity, and also um, to improve the interpretability, um, especially if you're doing a repeat survey over time, a longitudinal analysis, and you're doing hypothesis testing based on your expert knowledge of your, of your population itself. So if you have um, intuition about how the different subgroups are answering, you can answer those questions with, um, with some, some work um, with, with the, Pearson core, the Pearson coefficient statistic. Um, so that does cover what I wanted to talk about for quantitative analysis. There will be a, a workshop in October on survey reporting, which will get into regression analysis, um, survey preparation for future cycles, future iterations of your survey work, um, report structure and development, and then developing reports and dashboarding um, for stakeholders who are interested in your work. Um, so just want to thank you for your attention and for your questions, but we do have some time for, for questions now. So feel free to, to jump in. Just clarify, you said you were using SPSS here for for all of your examples. Um, for some of the, some of the graphics are in R. R, okay. Even the 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 race tables from R or or SPS. Because I've used Stata oh, a long time ago, and I know it used to give you some pretty crude graphs too. Um, um, all the all the visualizations are from from R. It's just the R, okay. uh, yes, the the statistical output is from SPSS. Okay. Yes, I just have a general question, Kevin. And um. 
there's a lot of decision making in terms of handling the data as, as we've talked about, you know, what's complete, what's not. Are there ways that you found to kind of counter any bias on your part when you have to make decisions like that? Yeah, yeah, that's an, that's an important point. Um, I think it helps to, you know, to use your, your professional experience to sort of write out what it is, the analysis that you want to conduct, um, and then to evaluate which of those analysis could lead, analyses could lead to, to bias. Um, so if you're interested in demographic subgroups, you may actually decide that you, um, you want to limit your exploratory data analysis to to other topics, um, so that you're not um, you're not developing preconceived notions about um, about what you see in the data. Um, you know, at the same time, um, when you're doing your exploratory data analysis, you're you're still early enough in your work that you're not um, you're not doing the sort of regression work and the reporting work, which will come in the next step of the process. Um, so there's still some separation from what we're doing here to reporting. So there can be another um, there can be another time period for you to think about um, the work that you've done um, and to see um, you know how bias could have entered into your analyses. But that's when we're that's when I'm typically talking to to other colleagues in my in my group in the who are who are working with me on the survey project itself um, to see you know. How how um, how else they would be conducting those analyses? Um, that might be a different method from mine, and to work out which would be the best approach as we move towards the reporting period. So I will um, I will go ahead and add my my email address in case you you all don't have it. Um, if you have any questions about um, you know the presentation today or any questions about survey research that I could um, I could assist you with, whether it's dashboarding or um, anything you heard in earlier presentations. Great, thank you, Kevin. And I would also encourage our colleagues here um, to reach out to Kevin because um, he is available to, to provide some consultation service and advice, um, especially to our teams as, as you begin to analyze your data and begin to think about um, how to interpret what, what you have collected. So please do uh, reach out to Kevin. Kevin, it looks, it looks like we may be at the end of questions. Um, so I would like to add my thanks again to you, Kevin, for leading this workshop. And I look forward to seeing you um, in October for the other workshops that you'll be offering. And just as I said before, we'll send materials out to everyone from today and encourage everyone to sign up for the next set of, of workshops. Um, so thanks everyone for attending. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks so much, everyone.